Hey guys, in this video, the brilliant Tim is going to be talking about minority influence and social change, which you are going to need for your A-level psychology. Now, this is such a fascinating topic, and it is really important that you make clear but concise notes on this. There is lots of things for you to remember. So, if you want to help yourself remembering all of these different things over my website, there is a set of multiple choice questions which will help you remember all the bits you need to when you're revising for your exams. We have already seen in this unit how individuals and minorities can be influenced by the norms, the behaviours and the wishes of a larger majority, or indeed a, a source of authority. But this process works in both directions. Sometimes a smaller minority can influence the behaviour, the thinking or the norms of a much larger majority. This is known as minority influence. This small minority can be as small as one person, even in a much larger society but this small minority can also be a group or a movement within a larger society. Minority influence inevitably involves internalisation. The larger majority comes to believe that the behaviour and the views of the minority are their own. They internalise those as being their own thought processes. To do this, however, the minority needs to be consistent. They need to exhibit the same behaviour and advocate the same views and positions over a long period of time to give the larger majority chance to do that internalisation and internalise these behaviours and views as their own. In 1969, a piece of research was done by Moscovici, who led a team of researchers. This was research into minority influence that compared the influence of consistent minorities with that of inconsistent minorities. The variable, therefore, was the consistency of the minority. Moscovici conducted a laboratory experiment, one done under controlled laboratory conditions. He did this by randomly picking 192 women or groups of six. They were then asked to describe the colour of 36 slides. This experiment therefore used the repeated measures design, where the same thing is done again and again and again with many different groups. All of these slides were blue, but the precise shade of blue varied from slide to slide. Each group of six had two confederates within it. And remember, confederates are people who are not real participants, but are actually acting as they are. They have full knowledge of the research method, and indeed, they're working on behalf of the researchers. In one condition, in one type of test, the two confederates who represented a minority in the larger group of a six described all 36 slides as green when they were actually blue. They were therefore a consistent minority. In another condition, another way of doing the test, these confederates described 24 of the 36 slides as green and the remaining 12 as blue. In this case, they were therefore an inconsistent minority. Their attitudes and their answers were not the same. A control group was also used to provide a baseline result. This group contained no confederates at all and therefore no minority. Moscovici found that the control group got a slide wrong 0.25% of the time, or about 1 400th of the time. This is a tiny percentage, and it's also well within the reasonable doubt given by the scientific method, so it can possibly be concluded that people never usually get the slide colour wrong. However, in the scenario with a consistent minority, 8.4% of participants sided with the Confederates. They incorrectly described all the slides as green. Indeed, 32% of the time, they agreed at least once that a slide was green. In this scenario with an inconsistent minority, the participants only called a slide green 1.25% of the time. Not that much more than the control group. The minority of Confederates was therefore able to influence the larger majority, at least some of the time. But what's clear is that this influence was vastly reduced when the minority was inconsistent, showing that consistent minorities have a much greater influence than inconsistent minorities. When we evaluate this piece of research done in 1969 by Moscovici and a team of researchers, there are many points we need to consider. This research was done under laboratory conditions, and there was therefore good control of the variables. It's possible to establish a cause and effect scenario. However, it is also unlikely that a third outside factor was having an influence on the rest of the factors and the rest of the variables due to it being in laboratory conditions. But because of this, the study lacks what we call ecological validity. Naming slides by colour is not a frequent or normal activity in the real world. Therefore, it's impossible to say that these results would be replicated outside of a strictly controlled laboratory setting. Importantly, the naming of these slides by colour was also a completely trivial activity. It was very easy and there were no consequences at all to getting the colour wrong. 
Many people subsequently since 1969 have suggested that the participants may have behaved very differently if either their money or their principles were involved in the exercise, if, for example, they were paid a small amount for every one they got right. A control group was used. This increases the validity of the results, as it does establish there was a baseline to compare the results against. This research was also repeatable. It could be done again by other researchers and indeed was. It was also scalable. It would be entirely possible to scale this initial research up to involve many more people. One major thing to consider, though, is that this test was only done on women, albeit a large group of about 200. So the results cannot therefore be generalised to men. Following on from the research done five years previously by Moscovici, Nemeth led a group of researchers to do some more experimentation with minority influence. They effectively repeated Moscovici's work, but changed some of the variables. Their goal was to try and establish if flexibility in the minority had an effect on minority influence. Once again, like before, participants were asked to judge the colour of a series of slides. All of these slides were actually varying hues of blue. Two confederates were each again placed in the group. This time, however, participants could name several colours that they thought they saw, such as green-blue or yellow-green. The behaviour of the confederates was also changed between variations, and in Nemeth's experiment they acted in a total of three different ways. The minority, therefore, was flexible. In the first variation, the confederates always said every slide was green, exactly how they did in Moscovici's variation. In the second variation, they said that some were green and some were blue-green, completely at random. And in the third and final variation, they identified some slides as green-blue, when this was plausible, and they just identified the rest of the slides as green. This minority of two therefore changed its behaviour and became flexible. It wasn't consistent. Nemeth found that when the Confederates, the minority, always answered green or varied their response completely at random, then there was actually no effect on the answers given by the real participants. However, in the final condition, where the Confederates' responses varied with the slides, remember that their answers were based on how plausible it was to answer green-blue, then there was a significant effect on the conformity of the majority to the minority. The majority began to change and conform to this minority. One conclusion drawn was that always answering green, regardless of the slide, was unrealistic, and therefore it was unlikely to change the behaviour of the participants. The majority would not conform to the minority if that minority was being unrealistic. Much of the evaluation for this research is similar or even the same to that done by Moscovici. It was under laboratory conditions, and therefore, to an extent at least, a cause and effect relationship between the variables could be established. It was also repeatable, it could be done again and again, it was scalable, it could be scaled up to more people, and it was controllable. There was, it is unlikely that there was a third outside random factor influencing the results. However, the study did have limited ecological validity. It was unlikely that this process would occur naturally in the real world. And finally, as before, the activity was trivial, getting the task wrong, and there was no investment of either money or principles by the participants. Following the research done in 1969, Moscovici formulated conversion therapy as an explanation for minority influence. This theory holds that majority influence and minority influence are actually two completely different and separate processes. Let's begin with majority influence. Majority influence involves compliance. People are complying with and conforming to the behaviour of the expectations of a wider group, something we've already seen multiple times already in this unit. People are therefore comparing and converting their behaviour in order to fit in. They're comparing how they behave and then converting it into how the wider group behaves. And in doing so, they're conforming to this wider social group. Minority influence is rather different. When a minority is consistent, as we've seen, it keeps to the same views or beliefs or processes, then the majority may begin to examine these views in more detail. As they do so, people may begin to internalise these views. They accept them as their own and become persuaded. Internally, at least, they may begin to conform to the minority position. Externally, however, the influence of and the fear of the wider social group may well mean that their outward behaviour does not change, but internally they've started to internalise the minority views and minority influence. Moscovici also theorised that minorities were much more likely to have influence when they were committed. They stuck with and maintained a similar attitude, view or behaviour. They were consistent. The process of minority influence by a committed majority therefore follows, at least according to Moscovici, a set and known process. Number one, initially minority views are seen as wrong. 
They do not conform with the social norm or normal social views of the time. Think of the attitudes towards homosexuality in the 1940s and 50s or cohabitation before marriage in the 50s and 60s. Number two, by being firmly consistent, the minority shows that it has a clear and committed view, a view that it's sticking to. They are not willing to compromise and the minority is therefore not willing to give in to pressure. Number three, this inevitably leads to a degree at least of conflict, sometimes even physical violence. The majority wishes to override the minority, but the minority won't concede or back down, so the majority cannot simply override. Number four, some in the majority therefore begin to consider if the minority may be correct. This process is known as validation, where people in a majority, privately at least, start to think about if the minority is correct. And lastly, number five, if a good reason can't be found to dismiss the minority view, such as a logical or mathematical flaw, something obvious, then more and more people begin to see things as the minority does. The minority has therefore begun to have an influence on the majority. A minority influence is happening. Latane and Wolf in 1981 developed an idea called social impact theory as an alternative explanation for minority influence. They argued that social influence happens when the net or combined effect of three specific factors reaches a high enough point, a given threshold. The first factor is strength, how powerful, experienced, knowledgeable or consistent that this minority is. The second factor is numbers, how many people are in the minority group. And the third factor was immediacy, how close the source of minority influence is to people in the majority, either in terms of physical proximity, how near somebody is to you, or closeness in terms of relationships. Somebody who's a sibling or a parent has a lot more influence on you than somebody who is a distant friend, for example. These factors can combine in different ways. One minority may achieve some influence by having a small number of extremely experienced and consistent people, while another may achieve influence by having a vast number of inexperienced or inconsistent people. Latan and Wolf argued that minority influence and majority influence are actually the same process, but the factors are different. A lot of meta-analysis, meta-analysis being studies of previous studies, has provided support for social impact theory, but some actual field studies done in the real world have either contradicted it or have found completely inconclusive evidence. Regardless of if social impact theory or conversion therapy is correct and is an explanation for minority influence, minority influence is needed in society. Without it, the majority would never change, and society would remain stagnant forever. As we've already seen, if some people in the majority start to invest and believe in the views of the minority, then this minority gains an influence. Eventually, it becomes literally influential. This then results in a larger and larger number of people converting to this minority view. Its influence becomes ever greater and greater. Eventually, the minority becomes the majority, and the old majority becomes the new minority. Van Avermaet named this the snowball effect in 1996. But for this to occur, a threshold has to be broken. People have to move from privately accepting the minority viewpoint in themselves and internalising it to openly expressing it in public and risking the condemnation and ostracization from the norm that may come with that expression. One explanation for this is called social cryptoamnesia. Public opinion tends to shift very gradually and over long time periods until the minority eventually becomes the norm. But people tend to forget where the initial minority view came from. A useful case study for minority influence and how it can become a majority view is that of US society and its continued segregation. As you may know, through the early decades of the 20th century, society in the United States was segregated. White people had very different and almost completely separate lives to black people living around them. This segregation was everywhere, in sport, in schools, in politics. It was completely universal and it was accepted as a social norm. It was very much and very firmly the majority view. Martin Luther King, pictured here, was different. He and others around him began to try and challenge this majority view and challenge this social norm. Both he and his followers became a minority, but they were consistent, they were strong, and they were vocal. Very gradually, more and more people began to take an interest in, and then at least internally agree with Martin Luther King. He was starting to exert minority influence on the majority view and those majority social norms. In the following decades, at least from about 1963 onwards, society in the United States became gradually less divided. The anti-racist and anti-segregation view, due to it being consistent and being strong, had exerted successfully minority influence, and due to the snowball effect, it quickly became the majority.
a second very useful case study are LGBT rights in the United Kingdom. Until 1967, and so relatively recently, homosexuality was a serious criminal offence in the United Kingdom. Rampant homophobia was very much and very firmly a strong majority view. At least appearing to be repelled by and disgusted by homosexuality was a social norm, it was a social majority, and most people conformed with and obeyed this norm. However, in 1967, the then Home Secretary, a man called Roy Jenkins, decriminalised homosexuality, but the majority view, that of discrimination and disgust, continued on for decades after 1967. The LGBT rights community was a small minority, attempting to exert minority influence. But this minority was vocal, it was experienced, it was strong, it was increasingly large in number, and it was consistent. Critically, however, it was close to many people, close in terms of relationships and in terms of physical proximity. A great many people had a homosexual friend, child or sibling. Gradually, the snowball effect occurred. More and more people began to, internally at least, accept the minority view and come to agree with it. Over time, this minority view of LGBT rights became the majority one. This was capped off by the Equality Act in 2010. Homophobia and discrimination is now illegal, and the former minority became the majority. Ouch! This is when somebody is, I've explained scratches. <laughs>